It brings me great pleasure to be able to present to you today the first ever series-based creepypasta ever narrated on this channel. Ladies and gentlemen, please sit back and relax as I tell you the tale of the Harbinger Experiment, written by Zion J. The world we live in is full of things we don't understand. Being the curious humans that we are, we naturally try and seek these things out. Doing so has led us to remarkable discoveries and inventions that we never could have imagined a hundred years ago. We have defeated disease built to the sky itself, and even created machines that could take us beyond the clouds and into the stars. If our ancestors could see us and what we have created, I'm sure many of them would see us as gods. Our innate curiosity and lust for knowledge has not always led us to greatness, however, True evil and darkness have also been uncovered in humanity's conquest of knowledge. And in the end, I fear this evil will be our due. I do not say this from the standpoint of a great philosopher who has sat and simply pondered things either. No, I say this because I have seen it, experienced it, I was a part of it. The event I'm about to relate to you is true in its entirety. This, I swear. I feel certain that this will fall on deaf ears, and many of you will believe this to be just another spooky story meant to give you cheap thrills. But I promise you that this is neither my intent nor my purpose. The purpose of this story is to simply warn you of what lurks beyond the veil of what we can see and understand, to show you what awaits us in the darkness. Even I myself don't understand it. What I am about to tell you has happened, and I feel certain it will happen again. In 1971, a not-so-well-known scientist began preparation for an extremely secretive project known simply as the Harbinger Experiment. I would like to keep the identity of the scientist a secret for personal reasons, so throughout this recounting, I will refer to him as Zimmerman. Zimmerman's background is unclear at best beyond 1971. All that I know about him before that time is that he had grown up somewhere in Maryland with a strange fascination of the occult and supernatural. This later made him an outcast among his fellow scientists due to how scoffed upon the metaphysical was, and still is, at the time. Zimmerman's opinions concerning the otherworldly were not the sole cause for him being an outcast, though. It was his methods that made him widely unaccepted amongst his peers. Zimmerman was well known during his time for being ruthless and cold beyond measure. He never cared about the means. All that mattered to him was results. And if he predicted the results to be valuable enough, anything would be worth obtaining them. It was this insatiable and brutal lust for the truth that made him feared among those that knew of him, and the few that knew of him and did not fear him 
believed in him and followed him and his work closely. The word harbinger itself has such a mysterious and intimidating taste to it. Maybe it's the way it rolls from our tongues, or maybe it's simply due to its association with the project. But the word always seems to carry a certain amount of doom with it. Which would make sense. The word itself means to warn or forebode. I can't imagine Zimmerman's reasons for giving the experiment this title, but in retrospect, it fits perfectly. Zimmerman came to a select few, me being one of them. He told us he was working on something big, and that he needed people who could keep confidentiality and not spread idle gossip of his work. While he did not fully trust some of us, he did know that we were professionals and that for some reason or another, we were all in dire need of employment. I had worked at the local clinic as a doctor, but I was caught stealing medication and was promptly fired. This left a very dark mark on my resume, so work was hard to find. I was also a native to Alaska and lived near where the experiment would take place, so I guess you could say I was a convenient choice. As you can imagine, I jumped at the opportunity. It was hard not to when I saw the payout. Fifteen of us were hired in total. Some were colleagues of his that had been working with him for a while. Some were maintenance workers, and a few were hired as private security. I was the only medical professional to be hired. It is still a wonder to me how he attained the funds necessary for the experiment. I would not be wholly surprised if his financing was not entirely legal. But legal or not, I needed the money, and he was paying. Looking back, it's a decision I have come to regret. After Zimmerman obtained his money, he used it to buy a relatively large plot of land deep in the frozen wilderness of Alaska. And upon that piece of land, Zimmerman built a concrete structure not dissimilar to a bunker in fact. The sole difference being that its goal was to keep any potential damage contained within the structure rather than keeping it out, as he put it. Most of the structure dug underneath the earth, which had the effect of making the underground complex seem so much smaller than it really was from the outside, as would be expected. There was only one way of entering and leaving the underground structure, and it was via a ladder that led from a small, unassuming concrete building on the surface, which I will refer to from now on as the entrance building for convenience, to the network below. After everyone had gone to bed at night, the hatch that contained the ladder would be sealed off with a very large and thick metal lid. Zimmerman was very strict about this. Located not too far away from the entrance building was a series of wooden cabins that would serve as the sleeping quarters for the staff Zimmerman had hired. Compared to the entrance building standing on the surface, the underground system was massive. At the center of the complex was the control room. This is where all the facilities, electronics and such were linked to. This included security cameras, lights and door controls. Consoles, monitors and computers lined the walls of this large, central chamber. This is also where the ladder in the entrance building connected to in the underground complex. 
Connected to the control room were three doors. One led to a smaller room that served as the infirmary. Another door led to a break room, and the last door led into the hallways. The hallways are where the complex began to feel extremely eerie. They were, for some reason, laid out in an extremely confusing scheme that led in circles into complete dead ends. These hallways made up the vast majority of the complex, and it would be very easy to get lost in the maze if you were unfamiliar with the complex. But, if you knew where you were going, you would find yourself standing before one of three eight by eight foot rooms before long. Each room had a camera hooked up to one of the corners of the room, and all three of those cameras were connected to a corresponding monitor in the control room. Cameras were also scattered throughout the hallways so that whoever was watching their corresponding monitor could see anywhere they wanted to, when they wanted to. Thick metal doors stood at the entrance to each of the three 8x8 rooms, and in order to open them, you would have to enter a four-digit code into a panel located near the door. I remember when I first arrived at the complex and how badly the hallways frightened me. I have always been claustrophobic, you see, and those hallways were so very narrow. The noise, or more accurately, the lack of noise, was also a tremendous source of fear for me in those bleak, narrow hallways. It was always so unnaturally silent, as if the entire world had stopped moving. It really made you feel like you were trapped down there. Thankfully though, I only rarely ventured into those hallways, for I was the only medical professional in the facility, and I had virtually no reason to go into them. In the beginning, I found it so peculiar that Zimmerman would ask for a medical professional like me on a project like this. But by the time it was all over, I soon understood why.